Hi friends, welcome to Raising Lifelong Learners. I'm your host, Colleen Kessler, and this is the podcast where I encourage you to trust yourself and your differently wired kiddos as you help cultivate their curiosity, encourage them to discover the world around them, embrace who they are wired to be, all while helping them discover their passions, interests, and raise them to become the amazing adults they're meant to be. Hey, 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 welcome back. This is episode 243. Today we're talking about play. I'm really excited about this topic because it's a huge focus in my upcoming book. I have a new book coming out. Some of you have heard about it already. The Homeschool Advantage, a child-focused approach to raising lifelong learners. You can pre-order it anywhere that books are sold. And within the next uh, couple of weeks, I'm going to have some pre-order bonuses. So while you can go order it right now, hang on to your receipt because I'm going to have you put that into the site pretty soon and you can get some really cool bonuses to go along with it. You're not going to want to miss that. So go pre-order it so you have it when it comes out in July, but hang on to your receipt so you can uh, join us for the bonuses. But in the book, I talk a lot about the power of play and how important it is for our children and specifically why we need to continue with this idea of play and play-based learning as our kids grow. So today we're going to focus on those middle schoolers and high schoolers and even young adults because we tend to forget about it. It's also one of the things we're talking about this month in the Learner's Lab, so if you haven't checked out the Learner's Lab, please do so. Uh, Just head over to RaisingLifelongLearners.com and click on the big button that says The Lab. All right, special shout out to CTC Math, our sponsor for this episode. We so appreciate them. I'll talk a little bit more about them in a few minutes. But in the meantime, pop your earbuds in, go for a walk, tackle some dishes, do some laundry, chill out with some coffee or iced tea, Uh, just take a break, and let's get on with today's episode. Okay, so like I said in the introduction, we're talking today about play, and I'm bringing up this topic here on the podcast because we are taking a deep dive into the power of play, the importance of play, and all of the reasons we want to continue engaging in playful behavior with our teens, our preteens, our young adults, all of our kids all the way through in the Learner's Lab this month. The Learner's Lab is a community that I run for families who are homeschooling neurodivergent kids. We spend the entire month, every month, immersed in a topic related to some kind of social and emotional skill or learning or executive function skill and take a deep dive. There are classes for parents. Next week, we'll be having a master class. It's a great time to join the group because you get to start fresh with us and start with the parent master class that talks about the topic, helps you figure out ways that you can incorporate the idea of learning uh, about those topics within your own homeschool. And then throughout the month, everything kind of loosely relates to it. We have a social and emotional skill class for kids. We have a creative thinking class for kids. We have a Q&A group coaching session for parents. We have a forum for parents where they can ask questions anytime. It includes access to me via DM. And then uh, we also have fun clubs for kids. We have a doodle club that meets once a month. We have a Lego club that meets once a month. And we have meetups for tweens and teens that meets twice a month. And so there's lots and lots going on. It's one of those kind of smorgasbord areas for families who have creative, quirky, outside the box thinkers and just need to find their people so they know that they're not alone and they can keep doing this homeschooling thing and keep going with their kids. And so check it out if you are interested in diving into this topic of play and really honing in on how you can incorporate more of it into your homeschool at uh, RaisingLifelongLearners.com. Just click on the button that says the lab and it will take you to the page that tells you all about how to join us. Okay, so today I really wanna talk about play in the world of what it looks like for our tweens and our teens and then even into our young adults. So as you might know, if you have been following along this podcast or my site for 
any number of years, my children are getting a little bit older. So I started homeschooling about 15 years ago. We came into it kind of kicking and screaming a little bit because my thought was that I was leaving teaching at the time to write full time while my kids were at school and that their needs were going to be met at school and then we'd have all this time to have lots and lots of fun once they got home and I put my writing away for the day. We never know what's in store for us, right? Because parenting cannot be predicted and things change. And things changed for us. My oldest is profoundly gifted. He is a very outside the box thinker and school was just not a fit for him. So even though my husband and I are both teachers and he still works in the public school system and I did for a number of years, we just couldn't get the system to work for our particular flavor of child. And so we went into homeschooling and it has been a great fit for our family. Sure, there have been ups and downs like there is in any family where you're parenting actual people because things change, right? And you're adapting as you go. So here we are now, 15 years later, and I have still homeschooling. I have a graduate. I have a 21-year-old who is an entrepreneur and uh, he's still living at home. Housing is very expensive right now. And, and that's great because it gives me an extra driver. I love having him home. And then I also have a 16-year-old, very active 16-year-old, an active 14-year-old, and an 11-year-old who's kind of bringing up the rear. So we're getting to that, that realm of bigger kids who have their own agendas. And a lot of times we as parents think, well, play-based learning and play-based anything just doesn't work anymore once you have kids of this age because they're doing their own thing. So first, I just want to talk really briefly again about why play is so important. I've talked about play before. There is, there, there's plenty of stuff written on my site about why play is important. Like I said, I have a new book coming out in July. There's a whole section on play in there, and there are some really great books and resources. I'm going to link to some of my old posts, old podcast episodes, as well as some of those books in the show notes for this episode. So you can check it out at raisinglifelonglearners.com forward slash podcast and check out those links to dive more deeply into why play is important for child development. But just really in a nutshell, play is just a natural out of childhood. Children are wired to play. They're wired to kind of figure out their world and their environment based on playfully interacting with it. It's why little kids babble and they touch and they put things in their mouth and as they get older, they kind of compare and contrast things. It's why kids gravitate towards imaginary play. They are kind of engaging with their world in a way that mimics their real world through play. It's why kids play teacher and school and, oh, ambulance driver and police officer and all those other things because they're trying to figure out what their world's like and they're doing it through acting it out in a dramatic way. Games are great for teaching kids, you know, how to problem solve, how to give and take and share. And and they just naturally do this. But a lot of times, I, I would think actually quite often, as we're watching our kids grow and develop, we shift with them and think that, oh my gosh, they're getting bigger now. We need to get more serious about what they're doing and we just don't have as much time for play. I'm guilty of this too. I have done this with my kids. I still tend to do this with my kids when I get overwhelmed or I get busy because it's it's easier to fall back on the idea that we have to check the boxes and get the important stuff that society tells us is important done first, and then we can do everything else. So play is naturally shifted to the background. I had a conversation with a friend recently about this because we were talking about just a difference in, you know, parent dynamics and family dynamics. And she was talking about her husband, who tends to be very project oriented, very job oriented, meaning like he comes home from work and, you know, decompresses for a little bit and then works on whatever needs done around the house. And isn't really good at breaking away from that idea that I don't have to accomplish something to have it be a successful moment in time. And so to sit down and play a game with his children or go throw a ball in the backyard or whatever it is, is the last thing he tends to get to because he's focused on all the stuff that needs done. And as we know as parents who are home with our kids a lot, like we are as homeschool parents, there's always something that needs done. There's always another load of laundry that can be thrown in. There's always dishes in the sink. 
there are always things that don't get done in the regular every day. And so if we based our lives, and so if we based our lives on the idea that we couldn't recreate until the stuff got done, we'd never recreate. We would never enjoy one another. We'd never take time to play a game or connect in a way that was not job related. We'd just be focused on chores and what is and isn't done all of the time. My husband does this too. The other day I I, came, I was with one of my kids who was in a, a show, a play, and I didn't get home till very, very late because I went to the show, had to get her there early. And then afterwards, she and some of the cast members went out for a meal. So I went with one of the other moms who has a child who can't drive. And we didn't get home till like, I don't know, one o'clock in the morning. And so the next day I asked my husband how the the evening was with the two children he had at home. And he's like, oh, it was okay. We didn't get much done though. And he was marking the success of the previous day based on how many of the chores did and didn't get done. Whereas I was basing the success of the previous day on the amount of time I was able to spend with my daughter one-on-one and watch her interact with her friends and kind of joke around about some of the different things that were going on. And it's it's easy to fall into the previous camp like my husband because there's always something that needs done. And so we need to, as our kids get older, try to make that shift more, more and more because our time is limited with them, right? And I know this is universal. Like I said, my friend and I were just talking about this too. And it's it's very common in her household. I know others who one of the parents tends to be more like driven in that we've got to get this done and this done and this done. And the other parents like, I know, but I just want to hang out with my kids. And so we've got to strike a balance. But we also have to remember that play doesn't go out the window and become replaced by a checklist just because our child hits like the middle school years or the high school years. Life does not have to ever get completely and totally serious. I want to be an adult who has downtime too. And I want to model that for my children. I want my children to know that they can continue playing and exploring as they get older. Play can look differently. So let's talk about that. First, let's talk about some of the misconceptions that that we have as parents about play as our kids get older. And then let's talk about some of the different ways that play can look as our kids grow and change. So one of the most common misconceptions when it comes to play as children get older is that, frankly, play is only for young kids. It's often associated with early childhood. And as children age, there can be a belief that it's just not as important and that they can no longer benefit from play. Like we know there's nobody that's going to deny a play-based preschool or kindergarten or even early elementary school doesn't have its benefits. But there are people that would argue till their death that a play-based middle school or high school is ridiculous because our kids need to get serious or how else are they going to survive in the real world. And the truth of the matter is that we just have to have more balance as we grow. We want our kids to work towards a goal and be successful towards that goal, but we also want them to have downtime. I've talked to parents before about an epiphany that I once had a few years ago, a handful of years ago now, when I was realizing that I am my children's only complete and total example of what a healthy adult female life is like and what an adult motherhood experience is like. Sure, my kids get exposed to a lot of different mothers and parents and husband-wife relationships and whatever that may be because they've got friends and they sleep over their friends' houses or or we have these relationships with, with other people. But you'll agree with me, I'm sure, that we're very different in our own home behind closed doors than we are out and about. And, you know, sometimes that just means we're a little bit more short-tempered or we're a little bit messier or less put together than we look like outwardly. There's always something, right? For the most part, we try, I try to be a what you see is what you get person and treat everybody with kindness and respect. But my kids see the best and the worst of me. Most people see the best of me. And so I want my kids to to see the best version of me as often as I can give that to them because I'm their only example of parenthood. I'm their only example. I mean, my husband too. So I guess, I guess it's the better thing to say is I'm their only example of motherhood. 
And I want them to know that that means I'm there for them and that they can be there for their children. I want them to know that I believe they can always come back home because they're they're my children for their entire lives. And that doesn't stop because they turn a magical age of like 18 or something else. And so they're welcome with me for as long as they need that support. But I'm also going to be hard on them if they need it, right? I'm not going to say, okay, yeah, just go sit here and, and whatever. I'll still treat you like you're, you're 15, even though, you know, you're 30. No, I want them to become the best versions of themselves too, but I'm going to be here for them. I'm going to be honest with them. I'm going to hear them out. I'm going to help them when they need help and step back when they need me to step back. I'm going to play with them. I'm also going to enjoy my own hobbies. They see me writing. They see me journaling. They see me trying new things. I'm not always good at them. They've seen me try. I was in a play with my daughter once. Uh, I hadn't been in a play since I was in high school. They've seen me try different things, and I want them to know that playing around and learning a new hobby or a new activity, it makes for a rich, rich adulthood as well, and I don't want them to stop that. I want them to go to museums when they're older. I want them to explore with their children and their spouse. I want them to go on vacations. I want them to explore the world and want to try new things. And so so I, I try to model that for them. And that, that playfulness can rub off. And so it's not just for little kids. There's also a misconception that as our kids get older, academics are more important than anything else. A lot of people begin to really think that as children enter middle and high school, there needs to be a shift to a more academically focused mindset with less emphasis on recreational activities, or those recreational activities need to be really, really limited. We had this conversation recently, one of my kids and I, because they were planning on doing a summer activity with several of their friends, and a couple of their friends pulled out at the last minute. And when they talked to them about it, it was because those friends of my child's parents had decided that because they only have one more summer before their senior year, they needed to be more focused. They needed to take an an SAT or ACT boot camp to get those scores up so they could take it another time and try to get, you know, more scholarship money, which there's a value in that. They wanted them to focus on work and some summer school extra classes to boost their GPA and do some community service work so that they could have a better looking transcript as they were applying to colleges. And that there is so much value to all of that, but we need to remember that our kids are our kids too, our teens are kids too. And while it's the last summer if if they're entering their senior year, as these friends are, it's the last summer they have as kids too and with their current group of friends because most of them are going to be scattered to all different places after high school. And so when we were thinking about what my daughter, who is going into her senior summer in the next couple months, what she's going to be doing before she enters her her senior year, we really wanted to strike a balance. So she's doing a a vocal camp. She's doing a show. She's auditioning for another show that's going to be in the fall. She's also taking a college class. We've chosen, because of the time constraints, to do an online asynchronous college class in an area of strength for her. So it's not going to be as difficult, say, as a class that is on a new topic in person with lectures and and like in-class assignments and having to be in a certain place at a certain time because she doesn't have that and wants to spend some time with her friends. So by taking an asynchronous college class in an area of strength, we know she's set up for success. We know she's going to be successful in getting a good grade and it, towards those credits. And she's going to still have time because she's going to be able to front load her coursework uh, to be able to go to that that vocal camp and to do the shows that she's going to do while still having time to see her friends and go out with them before they leave for college or you know in between the things that they're doing. So it's we need to remember that there is an importance to thinking about the academics and the future and how to set our kids up for success, but we're not going to set our kids up for true success unless we also, 
allow them to focus on their social time with their friends, their relationships, and then all the other things that recreation builds, play builds in our kids. Uh, Problem-solving skills, creativity, critical thinking, because all of those soft skills that go along with play and recreation and connecting with people in areas of interest and fun can contribute to greater academic success in the long haul. Another one of the misconceptions that parents can often have is that the prevalence of technology reminds us or makes us think sometimes that traditional forms of play are no longer relevant or necessary. And that if they're if they're just, you know, playing Fortnite together in a group or they're, you know, playing another video game or connecting virtually, then they're okay. They're, they're having their downtime, their recreation time, so we can pack their days with the academics or the, the community service or the whatever, the boot camps, whatever it's going to take to get them, you know, the, the best looking transcript. But technology, you know, while it has its place, hands-on physical, imaginative, and social play is still essential for well-rounded development. I have a couple teens. Well, I, I do. I have a couple teens. I have a preteen, and then I have a young adult. All of them engage in online play with their friends. My youngest plays Roblox with some friends. Actually, my, my girls play Roblox with friends, too. Uh, my oldest uh, plays several different types of games um, with his friends. But there's nothing that takes the place of them getting together. My daughter has friends over all the time. And while some of that time they're playing, like, Animal Crossing and, and Star do Valley and some of the other games on our on our uh, Nintendo Switch, and then they pull out the Wii and they play Wii Sports. They are also uh, experimenting with boba kits and making homemade boba at home, and going for a walk in our woods or at a local park, or they're you know going to the mall and hanging out and and shopping, or they're shooting baskets in the backyard, or whatever it is. There is a, a tremendous importance to that relational play that is not is not completely met with just technological play. There's a place for both of them, but we need to make sure that they're getting an opportunity to be hands-on, physical, and, and face-to-face. There's, there's often also a misconception that play is not productive, and some people view it as kind of a waste of time, especially when we compare it to structured activities like homework or a class or a job or something like that. But the truth of the matter is play enhances skills. It builds teamwork. It builds communication skills. It helps contribute to emotional regulation. And all of this contributes to our overall development of well-rounded people who can bounce from whatever comes their way. And they can be resilient when things happen because they happen. And, and so we want, we want them to have those opportunities as well. Parents think that, and I know that I can be guilty of this. I know my husband is guilty of this, that you know, play is exclusively for leisure time. It's a, it's a leisure activity, and there's no potential for learning and personal growth within play. My husband will often come home and, and see when he walks in, one is over here, and you know she might be playing on the, the Switch, you know, Animal Crossing, and another is just kind of like drawing or, or reading or just hanging out and then the other is like playing Roblox or whatever and he'll come in and he'll be like okay let's get going get off the screens I'm sure you've been on all day and okay so first they haven't and then second they've now gotten this time and and while it is definitely a leisure activity it also serves as a platform for learning and problem solving and self-discovery and promoting holistic development. They get to be a different version of themselves. And so just by encouraging them to continue to, to explore, they get to see what they might be interested in. And we have to remember, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but play doesn't have to look like going out and throwing a ball, and it doesn't have to look like playing a board game. Play is also picking up new supplies and trying a new hobby. It's designing and, and creating with Canva or another graphic arts software. It's, it's trying new things in a playful way to see what sticks. And so they get to continue to reinvent themselves. And it's not, that's not just leisure. Yeah, it's leisurely to be able to explore something with no idea of how it's going to turn out. But it's also learning and growth and development. Another common misconception is that teens don't want to play with parents. And 
maybe, maybe they don't want to go out and, I don't know, play a pickup game of basketball or play what you want to play. I guess maybe that's it. They don't necessarily want to play what you want to play, but I just don't think it's true that teens don't want to play with parents or other people in their family. While preferences change, most teenagers value and benefit from shared recreational activities with their parents and their family members. We have teens and young adults that come over all the time, and they're playing the a favorite amongst my older son and his friends is the game of Catan. They are actually doing like poker nights now, and every time I go in that kitchen and they're playing, they invite me to play. Now, I'm not a huge fan of that particular game, and usually I take the time to work when they're otherwise engaged, but sometimes I'll jump in and play Uno with them or something else that I like, and sometimes I'll engage in the things that they like. And so I I want to caution all of you listening and getting sucked into those stereotypes of teens don't want their parents around and the teen years are hard. They, they can be hard, but our teenagers want us just as much as our kids do when they're little, and they just want us in a different way. My daughter will have friends over, and I'll be playing a game with the younger siblings, the 14 and 11-year-old, and she and her friends will join in the games too. So don't discount the idea that they, they want to play with us because they do. Parents also often think, people also often think that play is incompatible with anything serious, and it's perceived as not being able to address serious issues discussions, health, or academic challenges. But the truth is that play can be very therapeutic and can be an effective way to approach and navigate difficult topics and provide a, a comfortable space for communication. One of my kiddos just got a got a Lego set recently and was building side by side with one of their friends and they were chatting about like deep things. And so play can facilitate great conversations because you're just hanging out and the pressure's off. And so play can be very therapeutic and it can be very serious and it can open up the floor for other things. I know um, when my daughter's had a a really long show run or she's exhausted, she'll often want to just sit and relax with her friends instead of going out or even talking, you know, with me. And that looks like them playing a video game Together, they play some common games like Battleship and and Connect Four and chess and things like that online, like against each other. But they'll sometimes do that side by side and then talk while they're playing. So it does open up the floor for this relaxed way of communicating and enjoying one another. The thing is, as our kids start to grow, we often forget that play is important, not just because it's fun, but because it helps to foster a positive and supportive environment that has very significant cognitive, emotional, and social benefits. And so let's talk about some of those. Cognitive benefits to play in, especially adolescents. It encourages teens and tweens to think critically and creatively. It helps to foster the development of problem-solving skills. Whether they're engaged in strategic games or imaginative play, teens learn to navigate challenges and find solutions. One of my teens loves to play role-playing games. They get on text with their friends and have these entire world-building situations where they adopt a character and they're navigating their characters through these different scenarios and basically creating a choose-your-own-adventure story as they go. That is imaginative play in a teen format. Cognitively, play can also boost memory and learning skills. Engaging in various forms of play like educational games, it stimulates the brain. It enhances memory and cognitive function. It provides a context for learning that's more engaging and memorable. When I was teaching in the school systems, I worked with preteens. I worked with young kids. I also worked with with middle schoolers and high schoolers. And the teens loved to play board games to practice different skills, trivia games, interactive games. They just love it because it adds a dimension to the learning and helps to solidify facts into their brains. It also can boost memory skills. We play the game of Spot It, and I love it because I can play Spot It with my 11-year-old and I can play Spot It with my 21-year-old. It's an easy game. You can throw a couple rounds in with no problem, and it's fun for everybody. But 
it's a visual spatial awareness game. You've got to keep adapting to the new cards that you're getting and scan quickly the card that's coming to see what it's got in common with the card you have face up. And so it's a quick game. It gets fun. It gets rollicking. I will be the first to admit, and my kids will totally back me up on this, that I can get embarrassingly loud during this game because the anticipation and the adrenaline starts pumping. But it's fun. We rib each other and we have a good time. Play also develops executive function skills. It involves planning, organizing, decision making. These are essential components of executive functions. These skills contribute to better self-regulation and goal setting for all individuals, but especially our adolescents. And we want to do whatever we can to help facilitate that because our kids need to be able to organize their space and themselves and their, their schedule in a way that helps them to be productive and contributing adults as they grow, especially as they're getting ready to go off into college or wherever it is they're going, like my oldest into the entrepreneurial world and then my my next oldest into the college sphere. We want them to be able to plan and organize and, and make decisions. And so play allows them to do that. It's also cognitively great for creativity and innovation. It fosters a creative mindset, which allows our teens and tweens to explore new ideas, new perspectives, new possibilities. And this extends beyond the time that they're playing because it helps to influence problem-solving skills and innovation in various aspects of their lives. I often tell younger kids especially to think about their brains like rubber bands. And sometimes we want to go from a problem to a solution and answer or a question to an answer. And that is more linear thinking, like we're going from point A to point B. But we, when we're really looking at problems or we're trying new things, we want to think of our brain as the rubber band that's not stretched into a line that's stretchy and being pulled in lots of different directions and can expand and contract because that allows us to be more innovative. And the more we use it, the more it gets stretchier and stretchier and stretchier and opens us up to more and new and better possibilities. I tell kids too that one of the best benefits to brainstorming is that you get rid of the easy ideas first. Your brain dumps all the common stuff. So the longer you engage in the brainstorming process, the more innovative your ideas actually become. And so we want to make sure that our kids have that so that they can cognitively benefit from those problem-solving skills, their memory and learning, executive function skills, and then creativity and innovation. But play in the adolescent years also has some great emotional benefits. It reduces stress. It's a natural out for stress relief. Whether it's engaging in physical activities or creative pursuits, play helps our tweens and teens manage stress and promotes emotional well-being. When we're engaging in play, whether it's board games, online games, Lego building side by side with our friends, or just being silly together, it releases happy hormones, endorphins, and allows us to feel better about ourselves and our life. It uh, boosts emotional regulation. It helps tweens and teens learn to navigate and express a range of emotions in a controlled environment. It aids in the development of emotional regulation skills, which helps them cope with challenges more effectively. It's a low stakes way to adjust to whatever happens with the roll of a dice or whatever. You lose, you learn to bounce back from the loss, which then leads into the next emotional benefit, which is it builds resilience. When we face challenges and setbacks in a play situation, it helps to build resilience. Our tweens and teens learn to adapt, persevere, bounce back from difficulties. These are skills that are transferable to real life situations. I was having a conversation through DMs with somebody on Instagram earlier this week because I was posting about my daughter being in a show and she was asking me how I got my my daughter involved in in theater in the first place and found some great programs to be a part of and so we were going back and forth and I told her she's like I don't even know if it's worth it and I said to her and I'll say this to you and I, I probably need to have a whole entire episode on it but I think every child especially every neurodivergent child should try a theater class, try to be a part of a play at least once, a musical, something, because first of all, it's very playful. You're you're imagining yourself as a character or you're if you're on the set team and the crew, you're devising set concepts and and making them happen. You're you're building a world. It's also very collaborative. The whole can't function without each of its parts. 
Every character is important, from the main characters all the way down to the ensemble, all the way to the orchestra pit, if we're talking about a musical, all the way to the crew and the stage people and the creative team. Every single person is crucial to the overall outcome of the success of the show. And so it's a really great way to help our kids learn those collaboration skills. But things go wrong all the time in theater. And you have to be able to adapt. So we just finished out. um, My daughter and my husband are at, while I'm recording this, they're at strike right now, helping to tear down the set and clean up the stage and clean up the dressing rooms and all of that because the run is over. They had two weeks of shows. And over the two weeks, Each show got better and better and better. It was so fun to be there and watch it. It was, you know, bittersweet because five of the students who were in the show are graduating this year, so they won't be back. But what was really fun, interesting, and fascinating was watching these kids, because these were all really talented kids, adapt when things went wrong. Because things went wrong. There was one situation where at the end of one of the big ensemble dance numbers, one of the characters was running off across the stage like she was supposed to, and she fell. She slipped and fell, and she wove it right in like it was part of the song ending. It was fabulous. She played it off so well that some of us parents who had seen the show multiple times already by that point were like, they should keep that in there because it was so good. There was another instance, this happened last night, when one of the characters gives my daughter's character a letter to take to somebody else in the show, another character, in order to set this character up to get fired. And it's really a like a nonsense kind of error because it's the whole point is to get this character that my daughter is playing caught with the character she is bringing the letter to because the show is a 60s show how to succeed in business without really trying and she plays a a really good looking secretary and this this clerk is you know kind of lascivious and so she was bringing something to him in order for this other guy was setting him up because he wanted him fired so he could get his job and all of the shows you know he gave him a letter pretended it was you know something with writing on it and the last show there was no paper put on the desk like it was supposed to be because you know you you set the props out beforehand and that particular prop got overlooked and so he's looking around for something to send her on this fool's errand to and he picks up a coffee cup and he's like bring this to Mr. Whatever and she looked at it and he looked at it and she's like okay Charlie whatever and she goes off and does her thing and it played off so perfectly Because the whole point was it was a fool's errand anyway, so you didn't need it to be a piece of paper. And the way the two of them just embraced, this is what's available, so we're going to make it work, made it feel like it was how it was supposed to be. Nobody who hadn't already seen the show five times by that point picked that up. And that is an improvisational skill. That is a thinking on your feet skill and problem solving skill. She had, her character had to bring something to this other person in order to set him up for the next scene and the person who was in the scene with her currently had to give her something to take with her and they both just played it off so well theater does that which is why it's a great thing to do with our kids it gives them the emotional benefit of resilience bouncing back learning to collaborate and deal with whatever life throws your way It also builds those relationships, right? Because we all depend on one another. You know, we're all intertwined to get to the final goal. And it's play. At its very heart and soul and at its core, it's play. And so they're playing characters and exploring different different perspectives. And so we play gives them those emotional benefits as well. It also allows for self-expression. Play is an, a medium for self-expression. It allows our adolescents to explore their identity, their preferences, their emotions, creative play in, in particular, like theater, like artwork, like knitting, like any of those kinds of things, writing. It offers an outlet for teens and tweens to express themselves authentically. And so when we, you know, we, we've got these cognitive benefits, we've got the emotional benefits, again, like stress reduction, emotional regulation, resilience, self-expression, 
that right there is is valuable and, and worthwhile. But we also have social benefits when it comes to play. I talked about collaboration, many forms of play, like I said, with with theater, with sports teams. It involves collaboration and teamwork. It teaches adolescents valuable social skills. Whether they're on a team sport or in a group activity or in a, a theater production, they learn to work with one another towards a common goal. And those goals are unifying to help them get to this final place where they have all contributed to the whole. And through that teamwork and collaboration, it also builds communication skills, both verbal and nonverbal. They learn to express themselves, listen to others, interpret social cues, and then contribute to the development of those effective communication skills. And then again, the whole shared goal. Play within adolescence also helps develop empathy and perspective taking. Role-playing, imaginative play, theater, group work, group activities, team sports allow teens and tweens to step into different roles and perspectives. It helps with empathy and understanding. It helps them navigate complex social dynamics and develop more meaningful connections because they're starting within that shared goal and developing connections, but then those skills are transferable out into the world. And then finally, it develops conflict resolution skills, which is a huge emotional benefit, right? In play, conflicts inevitably arise. A set piece is not there. A person from the opposite team says something that is very offensive. And adolescents learn to navigate. They learn to negotiate, compromise, and resolve those conflicts in constructive ways. Those are skills that are essential for healthy relationships and social interactions as they grow. And when we encourage play with our adolescents and we play with them and we get them involved in recreation activities and we allow them to spend a a lot of their time in those recreational aspects and areas, we set them up for those cognitive and social and emotional and other benefits as they go along. Okay, so I want to dive a little bit deeper briefly into two of the things that I think play really, really helps with in adolescents, and that's stress reduction and resilience. So with regards to stress stress reduction, we talked a little bit about that, how it's a natural outlet for stress relief, you know, whether you're being physical or you're just sitting side by side with your friend and you're, you know, chatting about different things. I talked about it releases endorphins, but here's the thing. When you're engaged in play, whether it's through physical activities like sports or it's creative endeavors like journaling or artwork or theater or or music, it triggers the release of endorphins and other feel-good hormones in your body, which are natural mood enhancers, which then contributes to the alleviation of stress and an overall sense of well-being. Here's the thing. We are living in a world right now where more and more and more research is coming out about how sad our teens are, how lonely they are, how disconnected they feel, and how depressed they are. Just making a tweak like having them have more opportunities for play as an outlet will help contribute to an uptick in mood. Now, this is not to say that just telling your kids to play, your teens and tweens to play, will make all of their depression or anxiety or worry or sadness go away. This is to say that this can help contribute to making them feel and behave happier and have a more positive outlook. I think that we need to be really clear that if we've tried strategies, if we're working on supplements and we're working on on feeding our children right and we're working on helping them have, you know, exercise opportunities and things like that, and it's still not working, they're still sad all the time, they're still acting, you know, in a way that says that they may be depressed or their anxiety may be dangerous, we need to get them the help that they need. Professional help is brave. It is not a cop-out. It is not a sense of failure. It's not a signal that you're failing. It is a brave thing to do. So if your kids need support and help, then by all means, get it for them. But with regards to stress reduction, it also is very cathartic for our kids. Play provides a safe and expressive outlet for teens and tweens to release those pent-up emotions and stress. So especially when our kids engage in activities like art or music or theater or physical exercise, it allows them to channel and manage their stress in a constructive way, which again leads to the opportunity for the release of those endorphins and it, it helps them build relationships and, and engage in the, the supportive and social benefits that go along with play. 
Hey there. Okay, so you've heard me talk about CTC Math for months and months, and it is because we just love it here. It has made my homeschooling easier, especially when it comes to math. I'm not a mathy person, and I never have been, but I love CTC because it makes it easy for me, and then when my kids struggle with a certain concept or they're not getting something quickly enough, I can watch the lesson too, and then I can get it. So it's teaching me, really, truly, almost as much as it's teaching the kids because if I don't get something, I can watch the tutorials. And that exact experience happened to a longtime follower, Sandy, who wrote in, we started using CTC Math following your recommendation, Colleen. One of my sons is so dedicated. Then, after watching over his shoulder, my other son started using it too. They both do an hour each weekday, their choice. Now, side note here, CTC math only takes about seven to 10 minutes per lesson. My kids tend to do one to two, sometimes very occasionally three lessons a day. So we're talking like anywhere between 15 and 40 minutes of math a day, max. But Sandy's kids are so into it that they are doing an hour a day, their choice. Okay, so Sandy says, I even enjoy it myself. I do the lessons with them, which is a handy brush up and will occasionally do some of the algebra lessons ahead of time. Math was not my strong suit in school, but now I love it and I wish the program had been available in the 80s. Too many people think they're terrible at math, but I truly believe we all need a method of learning that suits us. CTC math seems to work for all three of us. I asked my 13 year old son who's been using the program for about 18 months what he thinks of it And in his own words, he said he enjoys reaching mastery in a particular subject because I know that if I get a question wrong, he says, I'll have to redo all the questions until I reach mastery. That means I will have a full grasp of the subject and that's pretty satisfying. 13 year old, come on, like you can't beat that. Okay, FYI, Sandy says, I have the pass rate set to 90%. So parents, you can set the rate you want your kids to meet. My my settings, depending on the kid, are set between 85 and 95%. I've got one kid who is a full year ahead in math and he's really good at math and his is set to 95%. I've got another one who's a little iffy at math and that kiddo's level is set to 85%. So you get to do what you want to do in it and that's amazing. Okay. She goes on to say and finishes off this quote by saying, CTC math is unlike any platform that's out there. And I just love it. I appreciate you, Colleen. You have a special place in my heart for everything you put into your work. And I appreciate you and all the things you share. Seriously, I'm going to keep sharing resources like CTC math because they work. They make homeschooling easier and they allow us to do the things that we want to do with our kids and basically take off of our plates the things we have to do with our kids. Our kids need math. Let CTC do it. Check them out at ctcmath.com. Let them know I sent you. And then if you've got a story to share, I'd love to hear it. All right, let's get back to today's episode. Another thing that I love about play and its effect on stress reduction is that actually play is mindfulness. So a lot of times I talk about mindfulness here on the site and on the podcast, and it's it's miss often as like, oh, the, the religious experience of like yoga or something like that. When, when I'm talking about mindfulness and I'm talking about it in like a therapeutic way, I'm talking about mindfulness as being present in the moment, knowing and being mindful of what your body and mind are doing in space. And when we are playing, when our kids are playing in whatever way that is, again, play is not, you know, necessarily with like a dollhouse or action figures like it is when they're younger. It is with paint and canvases and journals and storytelling and theatrical work and knitting and maybe shooting some baskets or whatever. Whatever they choose to do for their play it it forces our teens and tweens to be mindful and present. They need to be fully present in the moment, diverting their attention from all of the stressors and everything else going on, which promotes mindfulness. So whether they're playing a board game or participating in an activity like watching their friends perform in a play or performing themselves in a play or whatever, they are allowed to take a temporary break 
from the stress of their everyday life. My daughter is currently thinking about her college application process. For any of you who have kids in the performing arts, you know that the college application process for bachelors of fine arts programs are very, very different than bachelor programs. They involve not just an academic acceptance or application, they require pre-screens, which are like pre-audition auditions. They're like preview screeners that they can pass or fail. When they pass those, they are now allowed to to engage in the, the artistic application process, which includes live auditions and oftentimes callbacks, second auditions. But they still also need to apply academically like everybody else applying to college. And so they have to get in to a program both academically and artistically and oftentimes kids will get into one or the other so they won't be able to get into the full program or they won't get into any and so it's a very fraught process and so she's already thinking about it because she needs to be now as a junior entering her summer before her senior year she needs to be thinking about the two to three audition songs she's going to have in her back pocket next year and the two monologues that she's going to have and then the dance video that she's going to have and then the extra wild card video plus all of the essays that go along with regular academic applications along with additional essays that go along with artistic applications along with some of the additional essays that she's doing to apply for scholarships. And this is really stressful for a 16, almost 17-year-old child And especially when they're coming from, as we are, and many of you are, a homeschooling perspective where we're doing everything on our own, it's important to be able to engage in something that allows you to just be fully present in the moment and not think about all of the things that are going on in your life. I mean, think about that. As parents, it's important for us as well. When I sit down to read a book, I actually just bought the book Lessons in Chemistry. Somebody had recommended it to me, and I saw some snippets online of the, I guess, movie or series that was made after it, which looked really compelling and interesting to me. And so I bought the book, and I'm just about to start it. And that allows me to be fully present in something other than all of the stuff I need to do to make sure all of my children are being homeschooled right, that I'm meeting all the needs I need to meet within my kids' different programs to get them into the things that they want to get into, finding opportunities for their, the kids to explore their various interests and all of the stuff that goes with that. So we want to, we know the benefits of it when we're adults and we want our kids to have the benefits of that as well. Okay, I also talked about the, the resilience piece and I think that this could be one of the most important things that play teaches our adolescents and our, our kids, but particularly when we get into adolescence. Play situations often involve challenges and setbacks. I already explained some of those, you know, related to like theater productions. But whether it's overcoming obstacles in a game or dealing with unexpected turns in whatever it is, like theater or a sporting match or whatever, teens learn to face and navigate difficulties, which then contributes to building confidence. When they've successfully navigated challenges in a playful way, it builds a sense of accomplishment and confidence. This positive reinforcement contributes to the development of resilience. Teens learn that they can overcome obstacles and setbacks, and they can be successful despite whatever comes their way. It's so important to build confidence. In fact, my last book, Raising Resilient Sons, A Boy Mom's Guide to Building a Strong, Confident, and Emotionally Intelligent Family specifically talks about that. Resilience stems from confidence and vice versa. We want our kids to be confident that they can do whatever it is they want to do, and they can handle whatever setbacks come from it, And we want to help them and contribute to that in any way we can. It also lends itself to the ability to be adaptable and flexible. It encourages teens, play encourages teens to be adaptable and flexible in their thinking and approach. This adaptability, it helps them cope with those unexpected challenges, changes, both within the context of play and in real life situations. So with that example I mentioned before of my daughter having to take a mug on this fool's errand in the show so she could set up the scene well, despite the fact that they were missing their prop, allows her to have experience with something like that through play. But then the next time something doesn't go her way or something's not available that she wants, she can think outside the box with whatever is available because she's ne- she's doing this through playfulness and so it will lend itself to the real life situations that require adaptability and flexibility. 
It also builds social supports and connections. When um, play involves social interaction like this, whether it's playing a team sport, engaging in group activities like theater or classes, social support and connections formed during playful activities can serve as like protection. It enhances resilience by providing a sense of belonging and emotional support. My, my daughter's been talking about a couple of the kids that she got really close to this year that she didn't get close to last year in the theater program but ha- had been around and she just connected with them on a deeper level this year, but they're going off to college. And she talks about how great that was to be able to have those relationships and, and that strong sense of community. And then also the sadness and the bittersweet part of you know getting to know them right at the time where she was going to lose them. But that gives them the the ability to support one another. One of those kids in particular is going on to a Bachelor's of Fine Arts program in musical theater and pulled both me and my daughter aside after the closing show to remind us that she's not going to be far away. The school she's going to is just a couple hours drive. And and she said, you're going to be going through all next year what I went through this year. And I've already done it. So we're going to go out to brunch and I'm going to show you the binder that I put together and how I organized everything. And then throughout the process, I'm going to check in with you and we're going to meet a couple times a month just to touch base and see how you're doing because the process wreaks havoc on you. And so she's built this emotional support system and what will eventually be this sense of protection is she's going through a very emotionally fraught experience because her friends not gone through it and they're they've bonded over this shared experience that you know one has just finished and one's about to go through and so it builds that that connection uh, which then will translate to other connections as she grows and then also helps teach emotional regulation skills because they learn to manage and regulate their emotions and learn from others how to do that this particular friend said, it's going to feel very personal several times throughout the process. Maybe you don't get into a place that you really wanted to get into or, you know, something didn't go very well. But you have to remember that it's not about you because there's so much subjectivity in it. And I'm going to be there to remind you that, you know, you don't want to lose it over every no because no's are part of the job. And so emotional regulation is learned through those relationships that come from the shared play. It also just, you know, when I've, I've talked before about the idea that there's no such thing as balance, right, in a sense that we can effectively and equally maintain every aspect of our life simultaneously. What, it, what going through life in a playful way does for our kids is it helps them know that a balanced-ish lifestyle is important and possible. Because they see that we engage in playfulness with them and on our own, and it provides a healthy break from the jobs, the, the chores, the tasks that need done, as well as all the academic pressures that teens and young adults possibly who are in college face. It allows them to recharge, reduces the risk of burnout, and then overall just enhances well-being. It also promotes healthy habits. When you're engaging in physical play, creative play, um, you're getting regular exercise, both physically and mentally. Uh, this is linked to those improved moods, reduced stress, and just a better all, a better overall mental health. It, it also brings in creativity, right? Um, we've talked about a lot about creativity on this episode. Uh, any kind of creative play, like art or imaginative activities allows adolescents to express themselves and cope with stress in a constructive way. So this creative outlet can be a valuable tool as they grow for that emotional resilience. I still journal. I journaled through my teen years. I wrote really bad poetry. I was never a good poet. But I wrote notebooks and notebooks full of bad poetry. And I journaled and I journaled and I journaled. I still journal. I doodle to get out my emotions and my feelings. And so they'll be developing skills that they can use to help their emotional regulation as they grow. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the, the myths, the misconceptions, why they're myths and myth, misconceptions, what the social, emotional, and cognitive benefits are to engaging in play with our adolescents, and then the, the deeper parts of the, the stress reduction and the resilience. But I want to talk really briefly, because this is a longer episode than I planned, about just I want to give a quick list, and I will put this on our show notes too, of what kinds of things we can do with our teens and tweens in case you're like, okay, that's all great and well and good, but like, what do I do? 
how do I play with my kids? What, what do I do with them or what do I encourage them to do? So here's just some quick, easy, nitty gritty ones. Board games and strategy games. My kids, uh, some, half of them like Catan, a couple of them like chess, a couple of them like Dixit. We all like Spot It and Set and Mastermind and games like that. These board games and strategy games require critical thinking and decision making. So you can pick whichever ones you like, but board games are great. Video games are great. They just are. I don't love them just because I don't like playing games that way. But, you know, Wii Sports, all of those kinds of things, Stardew Valley, Animal Crossing, Roblox, Fortnite, VR headset games, Beat Saber, my son plays. Video games are, you want to choose ones that are age appropriate. They have a balance of entertainment and cognitive challenges. They involve problem solving, teamwork, and strategic thinking. So there's benefits to them. Sports and physical activities. You can participate in sports or physical activities as a family or individually. You can coach soccer, basketball. You could do things like yoga. You can go hiking. I was talking to a friends last night for years, their whole entire family. There were three kids and there are three kids and, and then the two parents. They did family karate lessons and all of them reached their black belt in Taekwondo. So you could do stuff like that. Creative arts. You can explore creative activities like painting, drawing, sculpting, photography, journaling, doodling, those kinds of things. And this helps, you know, with the creativity and the self-discovery process. Music and performing arts, we've talked a lot about that here. You can encourage your kids to join a band, play an instrument, engage in theater, musical musical theater. Any kind of performing arts provides an outlet for self-expression and teamwork. Role-playing games, I talked about my, my teens doing that just in storytelling through text with friends. But you could also do things like Dungeons and Dragons. Um, oh, gosh. Magic the Gathering, things like that. Escape room challenges. There are real life ones, virtual ones, escape rooms in a box. They all involve problem solving skills, teamwork. My kids and I have gone to axe throwing together, which is a lot of fun. We've gone to escape rooms together. You can do any of those, like again, in person or at home. STEM projects, you can do like some science, technology, engineering, math projects. You can build robots together, try experiments, explore coding, programming. Outdoor activities are great, like hiking, biking, if you like to camp, those kinds of things. When my husband and I were dating still, we would have weekend game nights with friends, but they were they were tournaments with brackets and everything. Uh, and we'd rotate through different games. And it was so much fun. We had this like lame trophy that we had created as young adults do and passed it along to whoever won. We did video game competitions and board game nights and all sorts of stuff. It was a lot of fun. You can engage in like cooking and culinary exploration, maybe take a class with your with your teens, explore new recipes, take turns cooking and, and trying new ingredients. Book and movie clubs, having conversations about books and, and movies. Molly and I, my 16-year-old and I are going to be reading the book Life of Pi this year because Life of Pi, the musical, is coming to our, our theater district and we have season tickets. And so she and I are going to both read the book and talk about it before we go to see the musical community service projects. You can volunteer together and help to develop a sense of purpose, social responsibility, and opportunities for teamwork. You can do technology and coding challenges. My last with Eric Berlin, he talked about doing family tournaments, puzzle tournaments like the MIT puzzle thing. I don't remember the name of it, but we'll link to his episode and we'll link to the MIT puzzle challenge if you're interested. And then just social games and icebreakers encouraging conversation and things like that. It, it's just important to remember that games and play and, and social time like this with your kids has so, so many benefits. It allows them to become more resilient, more cognitively able, better problem solvers. It reduces stress. And it's just as important as they get older and learn how to be an adult as it is when they are itty bitty and learning how to be people. And so we don't want to forget about it. Again, if you're looking to explore play further and on a more deep level, then hop in and join us in the Learner's Lab this month. This episode is airing on May 1st. May is all about play in the Learner's Lab. And on Monday, May 6th is our masterclass for parents about incorporating play in your kids across the, the ages. So if you join us you know, soon, you can get right in on that live. But even if you join after May 6th, the the replay is always available within a a couple of days, usually within 24 to to 36 hours. So you can watch that masterclass and then send questions in if you want. We'll have a deep dive Q&A coaching calls about it. We will be talking about it with the kids. 
why play is important, what do you get from play, and how you can try new versions of play. And then the kids will also be engaging in play through the, the Doodle Club and through Lego Club and then through the meetups where Miss Marielle does some really fun, fun things with them. And so uh, we'd love to have you. It's a great community and we are better together. The thing about it is you can totally do this homeschooling neurodivergent kids thing. And I want to change the face of that. I want to make sure that you know you are the exact parent for your kid and they are perfect the way they are. And our job is to help them become the best versions of themselves. And that's what we do in the Learner's Lab. And so again, this month is all about play. So if you want to jump in and join us and dive deeper into that topic, check it out over on the show notes for this episode, along with links to the different books I talked about, some of the past episodes where I discussed play, and all of the other resources that you could possibly need to incorporate more play into your homeschool day. A special shout out too to CTC Math. We're just really grateful that they continue to sponsor this podcast because it's a great math program. Like I said and have said before, I'm a customer. Yes, they sponsor the podcast, which is amazing because it keeps this podcast going, but I'm also a paying customer. I've been a paying customer for like three years now, and I will be a paying customer until my youngest, who is 11, graduates high school because it's easy for me. It is wonderful for them. They are growing at leaps and bounds. When they are feeling like they want to accelerate, they can accelerate. When they are feeling like they need a little bit more help, they can go back and retrace the lessons. It's just really, really a great program. So check it out, ctcmath.com. Let me know if you're using it and you love it. Let me know if you have any questions. I would just love to hear feedback. Okay, have a great week. We're going to be back next week, same time, same place. I have an interview to share with you that you are going to love. In the meantime, have a great week with your kids. Play. I would love it if you did something playful as a family this week and let me know what you did. Do something outside the box. Do something maybe you haven't done before. Push the boundaries of play and enjoy your kids, whether they are young or they are in their teen and tween years. And let me know. There's a contact form over on the show notes, raisinglifelonglearners.com forward slash podcast. And you can hit reply on that and send me an email or you can send me a voicemail. Let me know what you're up to. I would love to know how you're engaging your kids and enjoying them. Have a great week. I will talk to you soon. Bye for now.